This is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Mesh Tsunami podcast. This week, we're offering five conversations from episode 15, our review of the SLD Think Tank 2024, with co-hosts Jeff Lazarus and Ewan Schottenberg, and participants Maya Thiel and Mike Patel. Plus, from the vault, a conversation from our review of INCBC in 2023, the predecessor meeting to this year's Think Tank. This wrap-up conversation focuses on elements to add and reconsider for Think Tank 2025. It starts with me asking the group what other topics from SLD Think Tank 2024 the panel should discuss before closing. You Lauren Schottenberg expresses the hope that future meetings will have a wider representation of patient advocates and allied health professionals. Jeff Lazarus wishes a representative from WHO could have been there. Mike Patel recommends broadening primary care presence. And Maya Thiel would like to see more on technologies, specifically citing proteomics and mass spectrometry as two areas she'd like to hear more. As an outsider, Louise Campbell asks whether it is time to focus more intently on preventive hepatology and pre-screening. Jeff elaborates on the concept of preventive hepatology, anticipates that pre-screening will come from other specialties, and notes that advocates and practitioners are focusing on preventive hepatology concepts already without actually using that phrase. Finally, I asked the group how non-practitioners can help drive wider awareness and action. Group answers very widely. This discussion demonstrates how much a small-ish group of 100 can accomplish when working with passion and focus inside an innovative meeting design. There's a lot to unpack here, so just sit back, listen, learn, absorb, enjoy, and when you're done, check out and perhaps contribute to the memorial page on our LinkedIn discussion group. Jörn Schattenberg. The one thing that we did combine with the think tank this year, again, was an NIT summit, which preceded the event. And while we said we have tests that do perform well, I think there is still a lot of room for training. And uh, Jeff, correct me, but this is something we really want to carry forward to in uh, one of the other format, in getting more hands-on experience on different NITs to be used. Louise could come along talking about her best practice experience and applying fiber scan and not having it sit in an office where nobody uh, uses it. So really that type of instrumental schooling or teaching people that are in the field that are going to apply those tests and maybe the modification of these tests, new technologies here too. Uh, that's something we want to carry forward alongside uh, those discussions. Jeffrey Lazarus. Yeah, in fact, as a part of Liver Aim, we have to train people in non-invasive tests. So we were talking with the coordinator about having a squad merge. So in future, the NIT Summit can work closely with Liver Aim. There's already an overlap in the lead investigators and we can do some of that training there. I also think that whereas the think tank discussants were all you know experts in the field but not from industry the NIT summit can allow industry to also present some of their work and we can debate discuss um, we had hands on with the hepatoscope with escopics and with the fiber scan from Ecosense but I think we can do more hands on even have some challenging cases how to interpret them maybe some quizzes for the group about how they would interpret different values what they would do next what what's what's available in their setting Maya Teal One topic we haven't touched on was Elias, Elia Tabas' excellent kind of state-of-the-art talk, which was really the only kind of true or classical talk during the think tank. He is, for those of you who don't know him, is an editor-in-chief of Hepatology Communications, Hepatology's kind of little sister journal and is also the king of liver Twitter, I would say, with, um, I believe, more than 20 or 30,000 followers, probably still counting. And to, even though I've heard him talk several times about social media and how to use social media to, one, disseminate research, to engage patients and other stakeholders beyond academia, he's really always very inspiring. And my take home messages this time was his input on video as a new format, especially for younger investigators and younger doctors and healthcare workers to obtain and to keep track of knowledge. And I think this is something that could potentially also be worked into to new programs that, that we, we learn in different ways. And a new generation, they go to YouTube when they want to learn a specific topic. And I myself, honestly, whenever I have a Gordian knot of some statistical problem, I go to YouTube as well. There's, there's a bunch of very good information there. And I think as a liver community, we can also 
also harvest some of the strength in visual dissemination much better than we do today. Roger Green. I don't think I'd ever be able to put together a piece of equipment without YouTube, even on much more basic things than what you're talking about here. It makes a tremendous amount of sense. We're rolling towards the bottom of the hour. And my first thought I have to tell you about three minutes after Jeff started talking was James Joyce famously said about the first page of the novel Finnegan's Wake, it uh, took him 18 years to write it. It should take you a lifetime to read it. And I'm thinking you had two people, 100 people for two days, that's 200 days. It might take you 20,000 days to process everything that came out of it if you, if you ran it all the way down to the ground. And Jeff, that would be a goal for your 40,000th day on earth. So I've got two questions for each of you. One is one message that came out of the meeting that we haven't touched on yet that you think this audience should hear. And the second thing is one thing you'd like to see next year that you didn't see this year. Brave one, go first. Well, I think something based on the think tank format that we didn't have so intensively this year is uh, the other involved partners. Um, Michael was there, so we had patient representation, but I'd like to open this up to a broader patient representation. The nurse representation wasn't great, and some of the allied health professionals uh, or some of the solutions we came up with were aimed towards allied health professionals, nurses, registered nurses, physician assistants. So coming back to the initial concept that we developed, I still do like the idea to address a broad audience and engage all of them. There's the right time for everything. This time around, I felt we had a good balance, but we might have to broaden that in the future. I'd like to see someone from the World Health Organization come back. So we had a director at one of our earlier think tanks, and we had an economist lined up who unfortunately wasn't able to attend. But we did have WHO, great WHO representation when we ran the World Health Assembly side event last year. Um, I'd like to see them at the think tank debating and discussing. Um, I should mention that we were planning a United Nations General Assembly side event on MASH, the first of its type. That'll be in September. We're hoping WHO will attend along with some ministers of health. So there's only so much we can do from our field. It's kind of the bottom-up approach, but we also need this top-down approach from ministries of health, norm-setting organizations and agencies like WHO, the United Nations. Okay. So first of all, if you'll allow me to find my way to New York to watch you do that, that would be an amazing event. Sounds like a fantastic event. And it's a short train ride from Philadelphia. So it's a lot easier than having to fly to Barcelona. Maya, Michael, your thoughts? Mike Battelle. I would add one group to Yearn's list. The primary care, I know we had a couple primary care, but maybe we could use more since they're still the front line. And so just to get more feedback from that group, because clearly that's important. And I was also struck, just as I mentioned before, just about, I think, the need for earlier education and just continue to find ways that we can teach people who are younger about what their world is going to be like so that they can get those habits started early. I'll just leave that. Maya? Well, so, so I'm a bit of a technology geek and I would I would maybe love uh, to see how how we can harvest and be on the forefront of using new technologies in the mass D field so proteomics and MS proteomics is rapidly approaching a clinical care I know in Denmark there are two hospitals now who have uh, mass spectrometry proteomics machines in the hospital uh, analyzing patient samples and I think this technology is is so powerful uh, with uh, so much potentially, especially to uh, kind of disentangle some of the heterogeneity we see in uh, steatotic liver disease. And it's obviously not close to implementation, but it's very rapidly getting there as these techniques are getting increasingly powerful, fast and, and cheap. Uh, so that would be uh, maybe a topic for for hepatology of tomorrow. To bring to next year's meeting. Okay. Louise, you have any questions or comments as an outsider? Louise Campbell. As an outsider, I was listening earlier on when you were all talking. It was the fact that are we approaching a time when we talk about preventative hepatology being a pre-speciality? Because we know liver disease is the towards the end process. And when you talk about early detection, when we talk about screening, screening liver health, is for me that early diagnostic, that early preventative, that early education. But that's a whole different field. It doesn't really fall to metabolic health. It doesn't really fall to cardiology, who are the also towards the end stages and involvement of poor liver health. So whether or not when you talk, Jeff, earlier about preventative hepatology and the, the coining those phases, where do we sit that to make it such a pre-screening? And I think, again, that was things that were alluded to earlier on in the descriptions of what was happening. So did, was that a feeling that came out that we need to sort of 
specialise earlier down with the screening. It's all right screening for liver disease. Liver disease is towards the end process. It's not the early preventative, but there was a big thought about prevention. The preventive work will come earlier before you reach the specialist. So there was talk about having trainings for hepatologists where they might get certificates, more CME style trainings and so on. But I think this is going to be um, something in endocrinology, primary care. You might have nurses and, and other APPs and so on that could get specialized in that. I think, you know, we're seeing over the years now much more interest in, in the liver. Not not a lot of interest, but a lot more than three or four or five years ago. So I hope people will see that value. We still have a WHO that has, you know, five NCDs on the agenda for the big high level UN meeting next year, none of which are, are, are liver disease, which is kind of amazing. But, you know, there's movement to um, to change that. And I think preventive hepatology will speak to agencies like the World Health Organization. Also, you know, we're already doing so much that is preventive hepatology and just not calling it that. Right. I mean, anything dealing with nutrition, anything dealing with exercise and healthy living is preventive hepatology. We just need to make sure that it's being mentioned as well. It's added value for, for not much added cost. So uh, I guess my question would be, and we need to, we all collectively need to dial up the sense of urgency about this disease. Knowledge and urgency both. If you don't know about it, you can't be urgent about it. But once you know a little bit about it, urgency becomes important. And I guess my question would be, how can those of us who aren't healthcare professionals help that happen? Those of us who run podcasts or do radio shows or um, just are citizens of the world, how do we help that? How do we support what you're doing better? Besides show up in Barcelona next year. From my perspective, I think it's important we send a unified message that liver disease is costly and gruesome for patients affected being diagnosed late. We have the tools to diagnose them and just spread the word about liver health. I think that would be, uh, you know, without diving into the all details of NITs or, or, or applications, um, spreading the world about liver health, telling, you know, your family, your friends uh, to live a liver-friendly life. Uh, I think that will be crucial. I think also hepatologists, we have a kind of a vested interest in the liver. So to have people who are not hepatologists, who are not trained in gastroenterology and hepatology, speak openly about the importance importance of keeping your liver fit and healthy, that in itself, I think, is a more powerful voice than if someone like me is trying to promote the liver. That's interesting. Go ahead, Jeff. Roger, let's get a, a cardiologist, an endocrinologist, a GP and a hepatologist on, on the next call. Let's get um, representatives from patient groups that deal with cancer, diabetes, and obesity. And I know you've, you've addressed that a little, but that's how we can grow this community of practice. So when we have a liver-specific issue, yeah, we need hepatologists to explain treatment development, to walk us through NITs and cutoffs. But then we need to talk to the others from adjacent fields and understand why they're not doing anything about it, or if they are, what they're doing it, and how they achieve that. Excellent. So two thoughts on that. Number one is unrelated to any of this on one level. I find at social events and other things I do in my life, when people ask me how I spend my time, I more and more find people interested in hearing what exactly I'm doing and what a fatty liver is and how it matters than say three years ago when the easiest way for me to be the loneliest guy at the cocktail party was to say, this is what my podcast is about. If it's not a medical podcast, that's not the case anymore. Second, Jeff, in terms of what you just said, I would love to work with you on how to do that. When you've got, when, when you got recommendations in place, you know, we have the ability on this podcast. And now back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please put them in the review section of the page from which you downloaded this conversation or send an email to me at questions at surfingmash.com. Next week, we plan to preview elements of the Easel Congress, which comes next month in Milan. Until then, stay safe, surf on, see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye now.